lies with you. Yes, you. Are you going to sit here and let it go to the top? 
Are you? Party members, pro, whoever you are, wherever you are, unite and speak up for your rights. This is a democracy. Speak up for freedom, for justice, truth, and for racial integration. You all have a state. You all have in you the power to bring about changes. If you believe in this, say yes. It's very simple. Yeah. 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 And thank you for joining Salib and Jonet, a most unlikely delay, a conversation with Anna Salib. My name is Shabir Hussain Mustafa, and I'm senior curator of the National Gallery of Singapore, and will be moderating this discussion. Today, we have the honor of chatting with Dr. Anna Saleh, who works at the intersections of journalism and music. In her long-standing role as an editor and journalist for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, Anna has produced online news and features focusing on science, health, and the environment, as well as radio documentaries on a range of topics. She's also a seasoned performer of Bossa Nova and related Brazilian music styles, and traced her own journey of musical discovery in a documentary called Brazil Calling which premiered in 2016. The documentary traces Anna's journey through Brazilian music from her earliest encounters as a child with the cult film Black Orpheus to the conversations she had with many of the legendary figures in the Rio de Janeiro music scene. Anna's most recent project, which is also the primary focus of our session today, is Sale Benjone, a most unlikely Malay a moving two-part ABC series that explores the provocative life of her late father who passed away last October. The documentary opens up fascinating insights into the creative process, but also challenges the post-colonial, in, in but also uh, brings to bear the post-colonial uh, post intellectuals' challenges. Listening to it, one is reminded of how words mattered and will continue to matter. Links to the documentary are available in the information panel. Anna was born in Tasmania and is now based in Sydney. As we will explore in her talk, the narrative of the documentary weaves together her father's literary legacy in Australia and Malaysia, and her experiences of living with him in Malaysia as a child between 1972 and 1975. This talk is held in conjunction with the recently concluded exhibition, Latif Mohidin Pago Pago, and its accompanying digital symposium, And You Wonder Once Again, which was held from 15 to 17 September 2020. The symposium featured a range of speakers, from writers to artists and activists. Together, we explored the perennial figure of the wanderer in Asian philosophical and historical traditions. By delving into their writings, we trace possible genealogies of the term from the Parantav of the Malay world to the Darwish of Sufism and the Sannyasi of the Indic cosmos. Wandering is a concept that lies at the heart of Latif Mohidin's Pago Pago. It is inspired from a mode of voluntary migration practiced by the Minangkabau communities of Southeast Asia called Marantau whereby they leave the familiar behind in search of knowledge and wisdom from the world. It is also a concept that Latif Mohidin turned to in the 1960s, when he encountered the complexities of the world as a young man studying art in Berlin. Europe was divided. He observed the rise of the Berlin Wall. Southeast Asia, as a region that was only just emerging from centuries of colonial insults, was no exception. Latif Mohidin returned to Malaya in 1964 
and decided to Maranta and develop a body of paintings and writing that he came to evoke as Pago Pago. A kind of sensibility, a kind of fever, a kind of aesthetic impulse, a consciousness that emerges from the wandering of the body and the mind. The wanderer is also a being that Saleh ben Jonat encountered and embodied in his literary work. As he moved between geographies, cosmologies, polities, and dare I say even boundaries. And this is also not the first time we have evoked Saleh bin Jonet in relation to Latif Mohedin's Pago Pago. Saleh bin Jonet was a steady companion of Latif Mohedin since they first met in 1973. They have often penned thoughts about each other's work, shared sympathies and formed alliances. In fact, we have met Saleh in the name of Pago Pago when the exhibition was first staged at the Centre Pompidou in Paris in 2018. Then his writings on Latif Mohidin and translations of his poetry were featured in the publication that accompanied the exhibition. Saleh's writings enabled us to think about what it meant to speak to modernism in Southeast Asian tongues. Later, when the Pago Pago exhibition traveled to Ilham Gallery in Kuala Lumpur, we staged the symposium, how easily modernism could be disturbed. At this gathering, we invited the writer Zabas to offer a creative reading of one of Saleh's provocative texts, The Amok of Matsolo. A link to the symposium recordings will also be made available in the description as well. My encounter with Saleh ben Jonet is of a literary translator and dramaturge who had ventured into the realm of the visual arts. Over the years, I have slowly gathered anecdotes from visual artists about Saleh. And I want to read something Latif Mohidin said to me not too long ago. I quote him. I met Saleh for the first time in 1973. He had just returned after his studies in Tasmania. He must have heard that I was a bit odd and kept to myself. We instantly clicked. He was very vocal and carefree, always ready to speak his mind. He came to my first retrospective in 1973 and studied the Pago Pago works very closely. I had never studied English literature. My exposure to modernism had largely been through German and French texts. Saleh introduced me to Yeats, and especially to the Irish writers such as James Joyce. But it was how he did it, reading aloud, dramatizing passages, he thoroughly enjoyed it. He is a dramaturge after all. Many times he would appear as a fiery Irish poet. I simply enjoyed his company. He would poke fun at serious things happening around us. He was very intense all the time, ready to launch into debate at a moment's notice. I think, this is Latif Mohidin speaking, he is the best English poet in Malaysia today. He was always a poet. His poetry bears vitality. It is unfortunate how overlooked he is. Saleh, of course, remains unperturbed by this. Close quote. We will explore some of these complexities in Anna's talk today. Indeed, Saleh would often instigate artists into developing artworks. Ahmed Zaki Anwar, whose paintings and sketches adorn Saleh's book covers, once described a conversation whereby Saleh asked him to make a charcoal or a kind of a sketch drawing of a woman grinding pepper on a batu giling or a milling stone in a domestic, ideally rural setting. Why, we may ask. So Saleh could fully unravel how the milling stone, the bodily movements it necessitates, and the spice-laden aroma generated by the pepper were all necessary components for unraveling eroticism in the tropics. It was necessary research, Saleh declared to Zaki for something that he was writing. Zaki naturally made the sketch. Saleh used it as his cover for his bilingual book, Sajak Sajak Saleh, Poems Sacred and Profane. Thank you, Anna, for joining us and sharing your thought process in the making of this documentary. Welcome. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. So we will start with an excerpt from Anna's two-part audio documentary, followed by the talk and a Q&A. 
Some basic housekeeping information just before we begin. The session will be recorded and we will be taking questions also from the public uh, towards the end. You can submit your questions or comments in the comment section. Thank you. People like to watch Saleh or listen to him read because there's always an element of danger. Oh, I can't hear it. <laughs> that there might be a riot. I think it's because it's we need time. rebellion in literature, but Saleh is too drastic. Uh, this was not something the Malays could accept. He would play the clown, but out of the clown's mouth came real wisdom, and it hurt. It hurt people in power. They wanted him to toe the line, and he absolutely refused to. Some have called Saleh Ben Joned the bad boy of Malaysian literature, an iconoclast, an incendiary critic with satirical wit, a poet and a playwright. He's challenged taboos about race, religion, sexuality and a whole lot more. Hello, Kirsty Melville here. And in the last episode of The History Listen, Saleh's eldest daughter, Anna, told us about the influential decade her father spent in Hobart, from the early 60s. And in this episode, we'll look at Saleh's return to Malaysia. Having blossomed into an ardent champion of free expression, how would he now carve out a creative and intellectual life for himself in his increasingly conservative home country? And how would Anna navigate the extreme emotional highs and lows of her father's journey? In 1972, when I was nine years old, I left Tasmania with my father for his homeland of Malaysia. My first year of school in Kuala Lumpur was a breeze. Everything was taught in English. But the year after, I got a bit of a shock. They taught everything in Malay instead. The government wanted Malay to be the national language. It was supposed to unite the country's ethnic Malays, Chinese and Indians. Ironically, my Malay father's first job back home was as a lecturer in English. On campus at the University of Malaya, Saleh Ben Joned made quite an impression. He usually wore all black, jeans, unbuttoned shirt and a beret, but sometimes he'd turn up to uni in a sarong wrapped around his waist. And for the students, he communicated a sense of freedom reclining on the lecturer's bench or outside under the trees to wax lyrical about Shakespeare or John Donne. Former students Sabira Sheikh and Dawn Marais Webster. He was the man on campus and all the girls were mad about him, oh my God. He would say whatever was going through his mind and I liked what he said because he was always bucking the establishment and God knows we needed that desperately in Malaysia. And it wasn't just on campus that he stood out. In 1974, Saleh created quite a stir when he urinated in front of a crowd. It was at the opening of an avant-garde art exhibition called Towards a Mystical Reality. Here's an actor reading from an article Saleh wrote called The Art of Pissing. I won't deny the mischievous side of me had a hand in it. The exhibitionist in me too, no doubt. But believe me, these were not decisive factors. Before the exhibition, he was asked to comment by the lead artist himself on a manifesto written to accompany the artwork. Saleh read the document in detail, pencil in hand, and found it to be verbose, but worse, an attempt to bully other artists into behaving in a certain way. And he threatened to retaliate with his own performance art if the exhibition went ahead. The disbelieving artist did go ahead, and the rest is history. Not only was my action fundamentally serious, it was also consistent with the spirit of Zen, which you keep invoking in your manifesto. A lot of people seem to have completely misunderstood my little gesture of friendly protest. Among the major things the act set out to do 
was to test a central premise of your manifest, as well as to protest against what I saw as pretentious, contradictory, and false. Sully we got your letter last week. An it was man. Great, simply great. For most of my life, though, I just saw him as my father, my abba. Here's a picture of uh, SBJ and me in 1975. We had so much fun together. The few years I spent with him in Malaysia as a child were wild. I tagged along with him all over the place, university, theatre rehearsals, film sets, parties, not to mention the kampung in Malacca. But it was really only in the past decade that I started to see him as a public figure. During a visit to KL in 2011, I recorded some interviews with SBJ while he lounged around in his sarong. Here's a shot of him from that day. We chatted about all kinds of things, about how his work was influenced by both his Western education and his Malay heritage, about freedom of conscience and the importance of humour, satire and parody. SBJ told me he found Western values liberating. He believed literature should be free to explore anything and to challenge the orthodoxy. And he told me despite his skill with English, he felt most comfortable writing in his mother tongue, Malay, especially when it came to poetry. I became aware of younger generations of writers and intellectuals who'd been influenced by SBJ, people like Amir Muhammad and Faisal Tirani, and a slew of young performance poets from Omar Musa in Canberra, Australia, to Jamal Raslan and Salfi Jaffa in Malacca. By the way, here's Salfi getting an autograph from SBJ. And uh, Salfi has, by the way, set up his own bookshop in Kampung Jawa in Malacca, which of course has SBJ titles on sale. Recently, a young uh, bunch of poets invited SBJ to be their guest at an event. But when he was too unwell to make it, they came around for a reading at his place instead. Some fans are second generation, like poet Jack Malik. Here's Jack with Abba a couple of years back. Jack's mother, Mech, was a student of SBJ's at the University of Malaya in 1974. She recalls being given a sense of freedom when Saleh reclined on the lecture room desk to recite Shakespeare. And she said lots of English teachers, artists and poets were inspired by Saleh. I also discovered an increasing number of students and scholars at schools and universities were studying SBJ's work. He spawned numerous PhDs. And all this piqued my curiosity to find out more about my father as a public figure. ABC radio colleague Claudia Taranto heard me talk a lot about my father and I eventually gave in to her persistent encouragement to make a documentary about him. Unfortunately though, by this stage, Abba was too unwell to do more interviews. So how was I going to include his voice in an audio documentary? One thing that helped was finding this cassette in my archives. It's an audio letter my father sent me in 1976 when I just returned to Sydney after living with him in KL for three years. I'd like to play a little bit of the documentary now that includes his voice from that tape, if we could have uh, excerpt number two. We got your letter last mm. week. It was great, simply great. It was worth waiting for, worth worrying about. I was particularly glad to know that you're having a good time. School is fun and Sydney is full of excitement. In Kuala Lumpur, we shared a rambling wooden house on stilts, surrounded by forest. Pythons and monkeys were regular guests, and the dawn was full of birdsong. I know it's rather fun to wake up in the mornings here. You know how fresh the mornings are at this place. You certainly can recall that. But I tend to wake up very early, mainly because uh, my mind these days is simply buzzing constantly. 
it can be rather unbearable at times. The only relief I can find is, of course, writing. And uh, I've been writing rather furiously. We bonded deeply in Malaysia. He often shared his innermost thoughts with me. I was 12 when I got this letter. The things I've been writing about, Anna, have to do with the pain, the happiness that I've experienced, as well as things to do with certain aspects of life and people in this country, which I didn't seem to appreciate when I was younger, before I left the country to go to Australia. On the other side of this cassette was an amazing recording from 1968. It was a kampung celebration held in honour of my father in Malacca. My father had just been back home for a holiday and was returning to his studies in Australia. And on the tape, you can hear these village elders singing, among other things, Nondang Sayang, as part of the farewell to Saleh. This is Tot Nafi and Net Besa and some of my cousins. SPJ's voice was also present in his essays, columns and poems. And I had a stack of letters that we'd exchanged over the decades. These really helped me get inside SBJ's head, beyond the public persona. But letters, columns and poems have to be voiced for an audio project. And finding someone who could sound like SBJ was a bit of a challenge. I had to accept that no one would sound exactly like him. But at least they could perhaps communicate some of his performance energy. Malaysian actor Kaha Akila was chosen for the job. I also did countless interviews in Australia and Malaysia with people who had known Saleh. This is me interviewing his eldest sister, Matjara. Others I spoke to knew him as a student, a lecturer, a friend or a fellow artist, like the dancer Rami Ibrahim. Episode one was relatively easy to construct. It focused on SBJ's early life when he was parachuted from his kampong into 1960s university campus in Australia. In Hobart, he honed his craft as the enfant terrible, challenging taboos about hot topics like race, and all this while having a young family. Episode one ends with a life-defining tragedy, the death of my younger sister, Maria. Episode one lent itself to an emotionally engaging half-hour narrative, but episode two was another story. This part focused on SBJ's life after his return to Malaysia from his decade in Australia. Apart from university lecturing, he acted in plays and films, wrote poetry, drama, newspaper articles, and was also in demand for his translation. Here he is rehearsing a play by Bertolt Brecht soon after his return. Not long after, he had to get his hair cut for a trip to, guess where, Singapore. Abba collaborated on plays with close friend Said Alwi, and he also staged productions with students while lecturing at University of Malaya. But he didn't thrive in the academic environment. For example, during a 1976 trip to Ireland, he was supposed to be working on a doctorate about the Irish poet William Butler Yeats at Trinity College Dublin, but he found much more inspiration immersing himself in the living culture of the country, the Irish people, the pubs and the politics. Here's a couple of shots uh, with him at the time. It was a challenge just to discover all the activities SBJ was involved in, not to mention the historical context in Malaysia at the time. And I ended up with a rough cut that felt a bit like a relentless catalogue of complex ideas. It just didn't seem to sing the way the first episode did. I needed to humanise it more. And the answer was to bring more of the father-daughter relationship into the story. So I returned to scouring through our letter exchange to find the material for this. 
When it came to the final cut, I had to focus on the best audio, but also on what would be of most interest to Australian audiences. It was the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, after all, that I was doing the documentary for, who would know little about Malaysia at all. Oops, getting ahead of myself here. Sound engineer Russell Stapleton did a wonderful job at helping me weave in the music, including songs from my um, uh, father's, the soundtrack of my father's life. The power of music to lift an audio documentary into another dimension can't be overstated. While you might expect a daughter to be somewhat biased, I did try and balance the documentary with some critical perspectives and to show my father as a whole person whose extreme emotional highs and lows were a major challenge, not just for himself, but those close to him. After all, what hero is not flawed? From one perspective, the story I told can be seen as a tragedy. Some might say, what a waste of potential. Saleh had the intellect to end up in a cushy academic post, but instead remained an outsider. But the real tragedy is not his failure to become a poet laureate or an Oxford University professor, but the fact that the Malay literary elite was unwilling or unable to engage with his unique Malay identity. No matter how he thumbed his nose at the establishment, it did hurt feeling cast as an apostate from his own race and having no sparring partners for his well-read arguments. Feelings that no doubt contributed to his final creative work. And this isn't something that I got to unpack much in the documentary, so let me do that here a bit. The issue of identity preoccupied Saleh from the moment he returned from his 10 years in Tasmania, or possibly from before that. Here's a photographic artwork by Yi Ilan of Saleh holding his identity card. For SBJ, being Malay was rooted in things like a love of the sambal belacan he ate as a child. It celebrated humour, sensuality and hedonism. It rejected fake piety and materialism. Being Malay for SBJ meant embracing differences, being a citizen of the world and seeing God everywhere in both the sacred and the profane. At the launch of his first book of poetry in 1987, SBJ read a poem celebrating the spirituality evident in the classical Indian dance of his friend Rami Ibrahim. Rami and Saleh were kindred spirits at a time of rising fundamentalism. At the book, uh, at the book launch, Rami danced as Saleh recited uh, the poem called Rasa. When I spoke to Rumley, he told me, I cannot deny I'm a Malay, but I'm also a Malaysian. You have many identities and it takes an artist to understand this. One of the aspects of his cultural roots that fascinated SBJ was the concept of amok. A Malay word that appears in the English dictionary and has been researched by Western scholars. Here's a folder he kept full of academic analyses on Amok, and he collected press clippings about recent cases. As far back as the early 70s, Saleh planned to write a series of plays on the theme of Malaysian identity, with Amok being the focus of one. Over a number of decades, he developed an alter ego called Matsolo. And this is the character that runs Amok in his play in part because he's disgusted with the society he finds himself in. For SBJ, the play was a kind of creative amok in response to everything that frustrated and disappointed him. I'd like to play another clip of Saleh talking to me in 2011, the year the play was published. If we could hear the third clip and nice and loud, because I think it's quite quiet. I had always been fascinated with the phenomenon amok, yeah? In writing this play, I suppose I want to show that even a highly educated man with a PhD degree, a person who runs a doesn't mean he's crazy, right? 
because this guy, Matt Solo, he has a clarity of mind, right? He knew what he was doing. The values the Malay people have degenerated, you know? Uh, he, I suppose, he tends to idealize it a little bit. The old, the old, The old Malay, right? Earthy. Uh, earthiness and all that, uh, you know? Relaxed. Yes. Um, la- uh, uh, copy the um, season season the, moments. Uh, and then the new Malay really made him mad, right? This is a beautiful photo taken recently by my half-sister, Hawa, daughter of SBJ's late wife, Halimaton. It's important to acknowledge I had a powerful personal agenda in making the documentary. Towards the end of his life, SBJ's memory faded, and this meant he was unable to read and write anymore. In short, to do what he was born to do. I wanted to remind him about his life and of some of the contributions he'd made. Sadly, he and I were not able to converse about the documentary when it was finished, but I relied on my research and exchanges with family and friends, especially Abba's close friend, Sheila Rahman, and on the trusting nods and smiles from the man himself to know I'd done a fair job in representing his life, even if I barely touched on his actual works. I was quite overwhelmed with how moved people said they were by the final product. And it is indeed amazing to think that just a month after the documentary was aired, SBJ passed away. I'd like to finish with a song. Abba loved listening to music, all kinds, as you'll hear in the documentary, but a song called Samalam di Malaya was one of his favourite. I could guarantee to bring a soulful smile to his face whenever I played it. He associated this song with Koronchong, a style of music that has connections to the Portuguese in his birthplace, Malacca. I like to joke that the Portuguese connection is one of the reasons I love singing Brazilian music today in Portuguese. Anyway, Abba was so very fond of old Malacca. And this is a postcard he got in 1972, just before he um, uh, came back to Malaysia from Australia. It shows the seaside near where he grew up. Samalam di Malaya is a song about a traveler that returns home and is sad because things have changed. The last line of the song was originally, aku hanya seorang penggembara yang hina. I am only a despicable traveler. This bothered Abba. And at his request, I changed Hina to Lara, which means sad. SBJ was an adventurous explorer himself, and he didn't see why those who wander should be rejected. After all, they bring us new ideas. And he was very fond of telling me that Malaya in the Tagalog language actually means freedom. So just give me one sec and I'll set up. I'll just sing a a little excerpt from the song rather than the whole song. Hopefully you can see me. Can you see me properly? (laughs) Okay. I can't see what you can see, so we'll see how we go. Dari rantau bertahun-tahun di negeri orang, oh malah, oh di mana kawan dulu, kawan dulu.
Aduhai nasib Apakah daya Aku hanya Seorang pengembara Yang I can't hear anybody, but I'm presuming somebody else is talking. <laughs> Thank you, Anna, for that fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Don't moving, you love online, online moving meetings? I, I, I'm, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to be a little bit greedy and uh, maybe begin uh, by asking you, uh, or rather <laughs> making a request, because um, I cannot help but think uh, after, after listening to you perform, just now um, about how this also led you uh, on this incredible journey uh, into Brazilian music. And I, I, I wonder if you'd be willing to, <laughs> to play something to us uh, just as a way to kind of... Segue? Segue, yeah. <laughs> and maybe even kind of collapse space time. Um, okay. Between, um, Malaya, as we understand it, and Brazil, uh, as, as, as you have uh, discovered it. Um, yeah, if, if, if you're up to it. Sure. Mm. Well, I mean, there's, there's uh, so many tunes I could play. So, uh, but maybe what I'll do is I'll play you uh, another slowish tune, which is, um, has very deep connections to my father because when I was in Malaysia in the uh, 70s with him, he, he started, he helped start a book club, uh, not a book club, a film club. And as part of the film club, uh, he was involved in this film club. I don't know if he started it, but anyway, he, uh, they got the film Black Orpheus, which is a, um, a, a fantastic film, French film, it won awards, 1959, cult movie that is the story of Orpheus and Eurydice set in Rio de Janeiro at carnival time. So you can imagine the color and movement. And as a young child, the soundtrack of that um, film just stuck in my head for decades and decades and decades. And I kept wanting to, I kept wanting to sing that music, but, it was kind of hard to play, so I had to work out how to how to play it on guitar, and that took me decades. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and luckily I found some other great musicians who like that style of music and could play it. So I'll play you a bit of that, shall I? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. I mean, I could do a whole half hour on the you know the history of Brazilian music or uh, well, Rio de Janeiro music, but maybe not. <laughs> Manhã, tão bonita manhã De um dia feliz que chegou O sol nos seus surgiu Em cada cor brilhou Volto um sonho então Teu coração Depois deste dia feliz Não sei se outro dia verá Nossa manhã Um bela final Manhã De carnaval Canta o meu coração Alegria, vou toda feliz Amanhã de este amor Uh, 
That's it. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, coming back. <laughs> To, to ideas and ideas yeah yes um, he honest. loved ideas as much as he loved music they're all this they're all part of the same web yeah yeah uh, one of the uh, after after um Thales passing obviously and, um and there was uh, kind of a real outpouring you know, of, uh, of, of memories, uh, but also you know, kind of recollections uh, yeah. around him. And one of the one of the texts uh, that was sent to me uh, is actually an interview uh, conducted by the journalist uh, Nasir Liza Hamza uh -huh. in two thousand and three. I think it was for a, a magazine or a publication for this, uh, published by the Star. And um, she makes this uh, fantastic observation. So allow me to be. I quote her, a conversation with Saleh is littered with ramblings, repetitions and recollections that sometimes uh, appear totally unrelated to what is being discussed. He even recited a favorite verse of the Irish poet Yeats and Andrew marvels to his coy, coy mistress. But how could anyone not listen to the words and deliberations of a poet especially when he is Malaysia's uncrowned poet laureate. She asks, she ends by observing this. The lack of recognition does not seem to bother him. Neither does criticism unless it comes from an idiot. His reaction then, she quotes Saleh from the interview and he says, well, if I can't piss on him, I'll spit on him, no score. I mean, it's, it's, it's this incredible kind of portrait, right, uh, that she constructs. And I think in tracing uh, Saleh Jonet's work, um, this expression kind of has recurred often, you know, to not be bothered by the lack of recognition. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of goes back to also, uh, in a way, his mysticism, I suppose, <laughs> um, you know, reading across uh, so many uh, different kind of paradigms, right? So, I mean, he could move in a single conversation you know, between, uh, between Rumi and, 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 and uh, Vedantic uh, to, to kind of deep history uh, of, of, of the Malay world. And, and I somehow find this quite interesting in terms of trying to access his, his modernist kind of ethos. No? And and I wonder um, whether we want to even go further back uh, to his teacher and mentor uh, in Tasmania, uh, James Macaulay, and the Earn Mali poetry hoax, right? So the hoax kind of marks a pivotal moment in Australian modernist poetry when Macaulay and a fellow conservative writer, Harold Stewart, submitted several poems that they had authored as imitations of the modern poetry genre. They saw despised. And the journal not only published the poems, but acclaimed them as critical and significant works. Right? And I'm certain uh, this was a kind of a revelation uh, for, 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 for Saleh Jonah, because that the conventions of modernism were not sacred, but open to debate, flux, change, right? but to also never take anything for granted, that, that culture is too precious uh, in that sense, right? Uh, for it to be assumed. And I'm, I, I want to know uh, what you think about this uh, in relation to uh, Macaulay, right? And his early years as a teacher, because mm. I mean, in a way, uh, Saleh was very much a modernist. So <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to also grapple with how this friendship, uh, you know, would have come to bear, right? Um, hmm. And maybe as a, as a kind of a, a related or an extension out of it, uh, Saleh's own kind of use of the English language, because he does something to it uh, as a result of it as well. Um, so perhaps you want to start with the Macaulay and maybe offer some thoughts. 
Yeah, actually, before we start on Macaulay, just something about the Mas Deliza Hamza's uh, quotes there. Mm. Uh, uh, a few a few things which I could come back to later, but one thing I just mentioned is when when as far as I'm aware, my father never spat on anyone. Uh, <laughs> he he might have uh, you know had other uh, other uh, bodily fluids uh, land on certain items, but uh, generally speaking, he played the the ball, not the man. I mean, he you know he, he was part of his um, way of making a statement. Uh, but we can come back to that. Uh, just back to Macaulay. So yeah, Macaulay, James Macaulay, very interesting uh, character in uh, SBJ's life because he was a conservative. He was a conservative in both uh, literature, poetry. He was anti-modernist poetry, as you've explained. Um, and he was also conservative politically. Uh, he was in favor of the Vietnam War and and, and things like that. So this was a very interesting character for Saleh to have uh, had as a mentor in his early days in Tasmania in the 60s and 70s. Um, but even though, so, so, but he learned a lot from Macaulay because he learned about things, the valuable things in the traditionalist approach, rhyme, meter, uh, the craft of performing a poem, all these things, uh, you know, you can, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are things to value in every stage of, uh, or every um, uh, style of uh, uh, poetry. But um, so, so he learned those things and he separated the man from his politics. And he, one thing he really, you know, the, the Earn Malley affair, SBJ thought that was fantastic because he thought whatever you think, even though it, it attacked modernist poetry, it was an attempt to attack modernist poetry, which he himself was a fan of, it was uh, such a, a clever way to make a statement, he thought. And, you know, this is a thing. James Macaulay was a public in intellectual and this is a way he was able to cut through. And SBJ, uh, I think, you know, in a sense, modelled himself in that respect when it came to uh, cutting through and provoking uh, discussion about things that we take for granted. Like you said, things are too precious to take for granted. He wanted, he valued in Macaulay the man independence of mind and and uh, the explore the, the the willingness to explore anything and go anywhere and have a rational discourse informed, you know, well-read, you know, no sloppy, sloppy arguments, you know, no unfounded opinions, that kind of thing. So I think, yeah, uh, Macaulay was a, was a trickster and uh, Saleh learnt a, a lot from that or was, was inspired a lot by that. Um, so, yeah, talking about his own provocations, one of the things you could call it performance art, I guess, you know, <laughs> whatever, all, all the things that he used to do to to stir the stir the pot, you know, mm. and 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 beckon, you know, rational debate about real issues that he was talking about here. An example of this when he was in Tasmania, for example, he was editor of uh, Tagatus, the uh, University of Tasmania. Um, student magazine and uh he i'll show you a cover the cover that he got to to poke fun at racism or to question racism so this is the thing yeah. so okay so this was this was a, a mixed race couple in embrace under the australian flag and the the title in there is color supplement uh so you know he's he was always uh having fun with words and ideas and political close-mindedness <laughs> and of course you know the the so-called pissing incident uh was no different he was making a statement provoking debate mm. um yeah mm. sorry I, I don't know if i've answered your question because yes, you, you, you have you have i think i think <laughs> Good. I think it's to offer a kind of context, right, about yeah. what happened yeah, yeah, prior yeah. to that kind of uh, mm. thing. But um, another question I, I think perhaps I wanted to get into this with you is um, 
you, you, you've shown me uh, photographs um, of Saleh uh, in his library and uh, his wide ranging uh, reading habit, I suppose, if one could call it that, right? Uh, could you talk a little bit more about this? And, and maybe we can show some of those photos. Yeah, yeah, if you could, uh, I'll share screen and if we could um, show my, my screen. Um, let's I think it's see. already on. Uh, oh, it's already on. Okay. I don't know what you can see and what I can't see. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, I'll just start with this. This, this here is um, a copy of Saleh's honours thesis from 1968. It's called Politics and Poetry in Marvel and Dryden. Um, you know, way back then he was bringing things together uh, about apparently unrelated things together. <laughs> and, you know, there are, so poets of that era and what was, what was the, how do they relate? So he had a love-hate relationship, talking about books, he had a love-hate relationship with books in the sense that books were his very being. And you know how you can love and hate yourself sometimes. When he was up, he celebrated books. He bought too many of them. My mum remembers when he was a student, you know, having to settle an account at the local bookshop because Saleh had just, uh, you know, run up a huge bill. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, and when he was down, he felt like he wanted to burn them all. I mean, he, he didn't actually do that generally, but, um, you know, the love-hate relationship, but he had a very broad interest and an insatiable curiosity. And before you were talking about, you know, the idea that, that sometimes he can seem to be rambling about a whole lot of unrelated things, but he saw connections between different things because he was so well widely read. Here's, here's a little picture of Saleh with his love-hate relationship with books. This is actually in a bookshop in Sydney when he came to visit me one year and I let him loose in Gould's bookshop. Yeah. <laughs> but he had all kinds of books, you know, ranging from the Pantun Melayu, Chris, Old Malacca, Sejarah Melayu, lots of books about religion and philosophy, you know, from sexuality and Islam, the life of the, the prophet and all kinds of amazing things, Sufism, Hinduism, Christianity, and of course, poetry of all kinds. There's a book by A.D. Hope there, who is one of his um, fans and friend. And he used to take notes all the time, crazy, you know, like, and he had a million notebooks where he would write down notes about what he was researching and he read about and thoughts that he had about it. And he was particularly interested in this collection of words and what they meant and how they were used and misused in his view. Uh, so, yes, you can stop share. You can stop sharing now. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yes. Yeah, so, I guess the thing is the depth of re his reading and the breadth of his reading is the thing that really made him the writer he was. Yeah, yeah. I perhaps um, kind of going a little bit more into uh, this question around um, um, also his moods, right? Um, mm. Because the documentary also uh, discusses um, his struggles with uh, with depression, mm. and 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 this is really bold, and I think a, a pertinent issue that uh, needs to also be in the open uh, as 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 a as a form of uh, thinking. And I'm sure this was not easy uh, grappling with this topic in the documentary. Anna, but could you could you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, um, well, uh, as I said, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to do a puff piece about about him. Mm. Uh, you know, I wanted to show him as a whole person. He can be 
you know, he could be charismatic and inspiring and all those things, but it could also be very difficult and infuriating. It's like the double-edged sword, you know, the, the, the very same thing that makes him so wonderful was also quite challenging. So um, I wanted to kind of show that. Um, he actually rejected the idea that he was manic uh, when he was high. <laughs> he just saw that as normal. That was normal and everything else was, that was bad. Uh, you know, you can have arguments about whether that's right. I think yeah. certain behaviours were definitely outside the, outside, uh, you know, natural high. And some of it was, I think, uh, encouraged by, you know, when he had too much of the antidepressants, for example, they could lead to a wrong kind of high. So, uh, yeah, the treatments cost a lot, um, both you know, money and, but, but mainly they cost a lot to him. Uh, and ultimately, you know, his, he had ele electroconvulsive therapy, which affected his memory. And that was the end of his reading and writing because eventually his memory didn't allow him to pursue those anymore, the things that he was born to do. There's also a social dimension, I think, to depression. Um, and I think in uh, my father's case, uh, the frustration that he saw, and I've seen this in many letters that he sent me, how he was expressing him and Saeed Awi and others, you know, would express frustration with what, the culture that they felt that they were in, that, that they couldn't get any, and for him, that he couldn't get any engagement you know, with with the things that he thought were really important to engage about. Uh, and the idea that, you know, literature should not be something that that it should it has to have freedom and, you know, these ideas. So he would have liked to have had more debate about that. Um, and of course, I mentioned before how it hurt to be not taken, not not feeling like you have the respect of your peers. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think also it was a sensitive balance for me to to explore his depression and and the the, the, the difficult sides of him. I mean, the sensitivities, you know, family sensitivities, obviously, and and also, I just uh, you know, you don't want it to. You know, it's getting the right balance. That was tricky. <laughs> what is the right balance? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I perhaps I wanted to kind of um, try and also engage with uh, a, a, a few of the questions or comments uh, that are coming in as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I think, uh, of course, uh, there is one question which kind of is, uh, if I may paraphrase it here. Uh, is is saying that uh, are there any plans to house uh, uh, Sally Jones papers, right, uh, uh, somewhere uh, in an institution, for instance, uh, well, that could potentially uh, 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 enable access, right, to it. So this is, I, I think, this is more of a kind of a question. I think uh, rather than requiring a, a response. Um, oh, well, except that I would say I welcome anybody mm -hmm. approach from anybody who's got a good idea about how to preserve his legacy in, in terms of his his books, his library and his papers. And yeah, definitely very I, I have had some young uh, poets, for example, and writers say, you know, they really because sometimes books go to a, you know, are bought by somebody and then they're not made public. Uh, I've had you know, people say to me, oh, we really hope that that doesn't happen and we'd love to read what he read, you know, yeah. which I think is a great thing. And, uh, you know, Amir Muhammad always said that, uh, he, he said that the good thing about uh, Saleh's writing was he made you want to read more. So, yeah. yeah. I welcome any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> great. So it's, it's out there in the world? It's out there in the world, yeah. 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 Uh, something for next. Um, 
Okay, uh, another question. Um, kind of thinking a little bit about a phrase that you mentioned in the documentary, um, public intellectualism, mm. right? And, uh, and perhaps if I may connect this, this phrase to his column, uh, as I please, um, which eventually, uh, which ran from 91 to 94, am I correct? Um, and then eventually got kind of compiled, right, into volumes. Um, there, is a, there is a fantastic quote from the, from the preface, and uh, I'm, I'm going to read this out loud now. I must be one of the most, if not the most, irregular columnists in the history of journalism. Yeah. But this hopeless so-called columnist, despite intermittent seizures of doubt about the quality of his writing, is sure of one thing. The column, if nothing else, triumphantly proved that one must never, never censor oneself and that one should always, as they say, test the parameters. Malaysian writers need to be reminded of this all the time. I'm sure the situation is not much better in many so-called third world countries. I mean, public intellectuals often, you know, um, on a, do speak to power uh, in, in, in various ways, and it's not easy, I think. Um, so two questions, perhaps a, 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 some, some thoughts about his public intellectualism from you, and a related question, which is, the preface was authored in the United States. And, and he traveled to the United States, uh, I think, on, on numerous occasions. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about that mm. as well. Yeah. Yeah, public intellectualism. Well, he, you know, it just, it, it's just what came out of him, uh, you know, out of his reading uh, and his thoughts about, and, and his commitment to uh, liberalism and, in terms of uh, the freedom of thought, the importance of freedom of thought and exploring different things. He liked to challenge things that were just given to people and it, people were expected to swallow it, you know. Uh, but he did it in a playful way. So his public intellectualism, intellectualism wasn't just... Um, you know, writing essays, learned essays, but he also, I mean, he coined this term bumijual, the, the, what he saw as the, the, the kind of uh, Malay class that had developed following the new economic policy. And that it's like the equivalent of a meme today, I think, in a way, a meme, uh, something that, 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 that can, uh, get people's again it's about cutting through you know the performance art the the pissing incident the uh dramatic entrances whatever i mean it's about cutting through and that's in i would say an important part of his public intellectualism so that it it uh it was creative in that way as well um so yes it was just what what came out of him being a public intellectual was just as a result of him being the curious person that he was and always questioning and always challenging and doing that on the basis of his broad reading and saying, hey, why do you use that, you know, the word kalwat, for example, that he would look at the history of that word and then question the way it was being used and it was being interpreted now uh, as opposed to what it originally meant and things like that it's so yeah and the us well he was there the many he many he went many times but um the longest period he was there was between 94 and 96 uh and that was because his wife halimaton was studying there and he, they took the whole family uh my half sister hawa and and adam uh, her brother, and it was a very invigorating time for him. I mean, he was, he was balancing house duties and writings. He likes to make a big deal about how he's he was being a house husband, but I I, I understand that he did actually 
you know, do some house duties there. And he used to write to me kind of saying, oh, I haven't got enough time to write, you know. Poor him. Now he understands what it is. <laughs> I mean, he finally understood what it was like to be a woman, <laughs> you know, trying to balance uh, writing and, and a career with um, house duties. And he was finishing his book, Adam's Dream there, which is his second collection of poems, uh, all in English. And he was writing about events that were happening there um, for the New Straits Times, about the O.J. Simpson trial and the Million Man March. This was in the 90s. And he, he, he wanted to uh, write uh, a book. I'll just read from a, you can share screen if you like, or you can not. Are you sharing screen? Yes, uh, yeah, okay. Screen, yes. I'll just read you from a, a little excerpt from a letter that he sent me. Uh, okay. The title I've chosen, he, he had this dream of writing a book, you know, the title I've chosen for my projected book, A Malay Looks at America Kind of Thing, suggests my point of view. A Great Wrong Place, a phrase from an English poet, W.H. Auden, who settled down in New York and had ambivalent feelings about this country. In between cooking and scrubbing, I'm uh, helping Aton with her academic work and the children, etc. I've somehow managed to make a start by beginning a series of short commentaries, which I intend to send to the New Straits Times as a fortnightly letter from America column. I hope I can sustain it. And of course, that was always the challenge with him is sustaining things because he got so interested in so many things and then there was the depression. The brief commentaries can form the germs or basis of the dream book whose theme would be the perversion of the great American dream. And I have to say, he would be, you know, jumping for joy at the moment. Oh, oh, hello. That's a sound. Yep, yep. He'd be, he'd be certainly jumping for joy. He used to sign, he said he loved calligraphy and, um, you know, even a, signing a letter could be a, you know, writing a postcard could be a work of art. And, uh, yeah, while he was there, he also, uh, there was the early days of email and he was emailing me also uh, sort of early uh, versions, drafts of, of poems. Anyway, uh, we can stop sharing screen now. Yeah. I mean, there's lots to say about America and, you know, he, but I guess we're running out of time. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, and I think... Um, let me just kind of try and, 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 and summarize all the different comments that have been coming through. Okay. Uh, a lot of them um, um, do talk about how it's, I mean, they really enjoy the music as well. <laughs> I know, so, so, so thank you for, for sharing that with us, um, really. I mean, I think, I think it's, it's incredible to, to time travel, uh, and and just travel uh, through ideas uh, at a moment like this when um yeah these are challenging times i think and i think uh, this is why uh it's it's so cru crucial you no know, to to have figures uh, such as uh, Save uh, also to read and think about um and and and, and make sense of 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 of, of the world um yeah Last question, perhaps, um, maybe the question that should have started it all, but I think we should end with it. <laughs> the title, um, how did you arrive uh, at it? Yeah. And then any last remarks you wish to make? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's Saleh Ben Jonad, A Most Unlikely Malay is the t title of the documentary. If you haven't heard it, please feel free to click on it and have a listen. Most unlikely, I mean, he was, as in the words of uh, people who knew him as a child even, Lua Biasa, <laughs> unusually naughty, unusually clever and unusually loud. So just as he has been uh, in, in as an adult. Um, he actually learnt English only in senior high school when he's mentored by the pioneering Malaysian poet Yi Tiang Hong, who wrote in English. And, uh, you know, Saleh ended up mastering the English language better than many native speakers. Now, I mean, you know, so much so that he was in, really in demand as a translator. And how likely is that, I ask you? So, you know, I think that in, a, in itself 
justifies it. But uh, also, you know, he was, um, you know, I mean, along the same theme, really, when he was at the University of uh, Tasmania in those early days, many Colombo Plan scholars were there for, uh, from Asia, but he was pretty different in the sense that well, people remember him as, you know, being, you know, I think one lecturer described him as a bolt of lightning coming towards you, uh, which is a bit different from the kind of um, more reserved uh, attitude uh, that maybe is, is, is most common. Uh, Muhammad Haji Saleh uh, has described his culture as being not Malay culture, not Australian culture, culture but Saleh's culture. So that in itself, you know, he, he is unlikely, you know, in the sense uh, of, of a Malay. Um, so, yes, uh, he's in, yeah, he's, uh, he, I guess the other thing is because of his interest in the kind of old Malay aspects of humor, sensuality, earthy delights, that kind of thing, versus the more contemporary bourgeois, <laughs> bourgeois might, might also cast him as uh, an un, likely Malay in these days, but I think that's changing. Thank you, Anna. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. It's been huge fun. Thank yeah. you. And uh, yeah, um, take care and, uh, to everybody, you know, who's joined us today. Yeah. Uh, please take care. And uh, we hope to hope to see you soon at our other programs. Well. Yeah. Ah, one last point, uh, the link to the two-part documentary will also be available in the caption. So please do uh, listen to it. Thank you. Bye all. Bye bye. Okay.